and welcome to Prairie Pulse. I'm Barb Gravel, sitting in for John Harris. Later on the show, we have a video produced by the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County on the history of the St. John the Divine Episcopal Church in Moorhead. But first, to share information about this fascinating church is longtime parishioner Barbara Glassrood. Barbara, it's so nice to have you. Thank you for asking me. Before we get started, why don't we have you tell our viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself and where you're originally from. Okay. I'm from Southern Minnesota. I went to Carleton College and then I did graduate work on the East Coast and I'm an art historian. I taught art history at Concordia for many years and one of the joys of doing that was every May I took students to Europe for a month uh, on their program called uh, the May Seminars in Europe. And we went to Italy and Greece and looked at the uh, art there. And it was fascinating to do and the students loved it. And over the years I've met many of them who have gone back time and time again to Europe because of their first experience. Uh, but I'm retired now, so I don't do that. I go to Europe myself, but not with a group. Well, good for you. That is certainly accomplishments uh, that you have in the world, isn't it? Uh, let's get started by you telling us a little bit about this amazing, fascinating church that you are so passionate about. Well, it is a fascinating church. It was built by such a noted architect and uh, it means a lot to me. Good, good, good. Now, I know that um, recently, I believe it was in August, um, you all submitted a grant to the Minnesota State Historical Society, didn't you, uh, to help pay for a new roof. Tell me kind of what happens there. Well, we, needed, we need a new roof badly because over the years, uh, other parishioners have put one layer of uh, asphalt shingles on top of another and now they're beginning to just peel off. We see them, find them on the grass and uh, when we had a condition assessment done it was made very clear to us that we need a new roof, an entirely new roof and it, the catch is it needs to be wood shingles like the original <clears throat> Because, excuse me, because we're, uh, we're now on the list of historic sites, mm -hmm. and so we have to conform to yes. their rules. When was the church built? In uh, 1898. Oh my goodness. It's the oldest church in Moorhead. Wow, that's amazing. And now the roof, certainly, I mean, over that many years, maybe it's been replaced, but like you said, maybe not adequately. Um, so that needs to be done. And in lieu of the wonderful architect, uh, Cass Gilbert, who designed the church and had so many achievements, I mean, you want to put this church back together the proper way so that it's done right, right? Well, we have to uh, because we are members now of the historical, uh, it is a historic site. And that means that we can't put on a asphalt roof which is difficult, but that's true. Mm -hmm. So the funding didn't come through, did it? It didn't on this uh, time, but we're, we've been asked to submit our grant again in May. And we're hoping then that uh, they'll be able to fund us. But we're gonna have a new roof no matter what. I don't know how we'll do it, but we had a fundraising event in August and it was far more successful than we thought. And so we have uh, more funds than we had expected. So we're gonna get a new roof one way or another. Good, good, I wish you the best with that. Now I mentioned Cass Gilbert as the architect of the church. Tell us a little bit about him and his achievements. Well, he's an interesting person. <clears throat> he uh, grew up in St. Paul he started at McAllister, and the dates, I should probably tell you. Uh, he was born in 1859. 
and he died in 1934. But uh, as a young man, his family moved to St. Paul, and he went to McAllister College, okay. but he didn't graduate. Instead, he left it. He must have found, uh, must have found that architecture was what he was interested in. So he left it and went to MIT in uh, Cambridge and eventually got his uh, degree, or whatever they call that, uh, from MS MIT and uh, came back to his home in St. Paul and joined McKim, Mead and Wright White, which is a big architectural firm, mm -hmm. and started his career. And in uh, 18, 98, he was, at, he was asked by a very important man in Moorhead to design uh, our church. And the interesting thing is that at the time, Cass Gilbert had designed the uh, NP Depot in Fargo. Oh, really? Yeah. It didn't know that was a historic building, but it is. Wow. And so we think, anyway, that probably Benjamin Makel, who was uh, then the senior warden, and he was senior warden for something like 69 years. Oh. Oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was a young man too. These were both fellows in their 20s. And we think that he got acquainted with Cass Gilbert. I don't think he actually built the church, but he designed it. So uh, maybe that's what the connection was. So in 19, 1898, uh, uh, he, Mr. Makel asked Cass Gilbert to design a church for us. Okay. Wow, and here you are today, yeah. all these years later, enjoying it and, and worshiping. That's wonderful. And the interesting thing about the church is it looks very English. Oh. Uh, it, and the reason, I think, is that after uh, Cass Gilbert graduated from MIT, he spent the next three years in Europe, and most of it was in England. And uh, our church looks just like many parish churches in England. A uh, high steeple and very elaborate inside roof. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can very clearly see what his influence was. Uh, plus, uh, it is in the form of something called shingle style, which was very popular in the 1890s, uh, in which you use native materials. Uh, the uh, uh, foundation is large stones that were found near here. And then, of course, the walls are shingled and the roof was shingled too, <laughs> and will be again. Exactly. Well, that's wonderful. It sounds like a beautiful church. Let's switch gears now, and can you talk to me a little bit about the present congregation, which is largely Sudanese, and tell yes. me how this came about. Well, in uh, two things happened. In the late, uh, it'd be, it, about 2000, a little bit before that, mm -hmm. uh, our parish was kind of diminishing. I think the original uh, parishioners were dying off or moving away, mm -hmm. and so we were getting less and less. <clears throat> and one thing that was done then was we joined the Diocese of North Dakota rather than Minnesota, because the bishop was right across the river and in uh, the, it, as a Minnesota diocese church, uh, that we would have had to go to the Twin Cities to see the bishop. So uh, the bishop of North Dakota at that time was a man named Andrew Fairfield, and he was very much involved with the whole business of refugees from Sudan coming to this country. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the refugees was if they were Christian, they had been brought up as Anglican or Episcopalians because of the British presence in Sudan. And so uh, 
these were a bunch of Episcopalians who were coming, and so it seemed logical that they come to our church, and they did. Wonderful, wonderful. Tell me a little bit how they helped revitalize your parish. They came, uh, the first ones who came were, I think, 12 of the, quote, lost boys, oh. which everybody knew about at the time because of the terrible conditions in Sudan. And uh, then soon after that, they brought their families. And uh, the, the lovely thing was that since we all shared the same prayer book, we never felt entirely strange to each other because we had this much totally in common. Wow. And we've been talking about that lately and it's really true. It is. Now, do you think the resettlement of refugees in our area is important? Oh, yes. And tell me why. Well, it certainly revitalized our church and uh, so many of them were in such desperate straits there was nothing else one could do but to uh, see that they could put down roots here. Mm -hmm. And they revitalized our church just by their presence. Did they bring some of their music and some of their culture to you all? Yes, they did. Tell us how. Well, their, their music particularly. And of course, uh, well, we have three services on Sundays. <clears throat> the main one is uh, the 1031 in which everybody comes. Uh, but then there's also a service after that for the Sudanese who speak, who are Dinka, and another one in the early afternoon for the Sudanese who want to speak Arabic. But the songs that we sing in church are Arabic songs, and even the Anglos try to sing with them. <laughs> Do they? But their music is very interesting. It's full of drums and loud noises, and it's very exciting. They sang at our uh, uh, fundraiser, and they were so popular that they've been asked to sing at the Yemkov Center and at the Plains Museum. Really? Yeah, the men who sang. Oh, wow. So that was nice. I'm sure it helped their ego. I, I bet. <laughs> wonderful. That's very exciting yeah. for them. So it seems like they've been incorporated into your church just wonderfully. And the little children sang as well, and they were just charming. Wow. So. Good. That's wonderful. Can you tell me a little bit about the leadership in the church and the deacon? Yes. Uh, the, we've had many priests over the 67 years that I've been a member. Uh, some of them lasted a long time and some didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we are, we have a, a quite new uh, pastor who is only one third time because of our finances. Uh, but we've had a deacon for quite a long time. She, her name is Barbara Olson mm -hmm. and she, uh, has been a parishioner almost as long as I have. Uh, and she and I are the only two who remember all these old things. But uh, about 12 years ago or so, she was ordained deacon. And she does so much for the church. She, uh, she writes the bulletin every week. Uh, she is also our treasurer, which is very important. And uh, she visits the sick. And when we don't have a, a priest, uh, she can perform the Sunday ceremonies. But she is just, I can't tell you all the things that she is responsible for. That's wonderful. She's a wonderful woman. Good, good. Is it difficult anymore to maintain a church and all the vibrant congregation with regard to funding and, and the people? Yes, it is for us, and I think other Episcopal churches find the same. Uh, and I don't know exactly why, perhaps just the uh, character of the town 
has changed because other churches, I think, are flourishing. Mm. But I think over the country, the uh, Episcopal Church is, uh, is, is not quite so popular. But uh, I, ours is, I think, uh, showing hopeful signs, mm -hmm. mostly because of our congregation. Mm -hmm. The first uh, priest we had since the Sudanese came was Father uh, Alex uh, Lodu Kenyi, who was a Sudanese. And he was our priest until he retired. And he, was, he is still active and he still fills in sometimes when we don't have our present uh, rector. Why do you think churches are still important to people? Why are they important? Yes. That's a, such a big question. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, why are they important? Well, they, if pe people are s devout and sincere, it's a way that they can uh, express themselves and find comfort and uh, find community with other Christians. So it's, it's essential, I think, that churches thrive. Wonderful. Um, how has helping the Sudanese and working with them at your church enriched your life? Well, it has because they are enthusiastic and they are very friendly. And uh, we have a custom, which I think some other churches have too, that part of the service is what we call passing the peace, in which you suddenly stand up and shake hands with the person next to you. But in our parish, we don't just end in the next person, get out into the aisle, <laughs> walk up and down and shake hands with everybody. And somehow that's sort of a, a unifying thing. It is, it is. How many parishioners are in your church altogether? And then do you know the degree or the amount of Sudanese parishioners? I would, I, I do not have real statistics, but I would imagine that on the rolls there would be about 150, but uh, not nearly that many uh, come to church every Sunday. Um, and especially since we have three services, mm -hmm. each one has some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the difference between the Episcopal, the Methodist, and the Lutheran denominations? Let's well, sort of a question that I may be not quite qualified to uh, <laughs> discuss. Uh, ours springs more or less directly from the church that started when Henry VIII severed the church from Rome. It's just about the same. So it has many uh, Catholic uh, aspects, which is, makes it a little different from the other churches. We have a prayer book. Our ritual is based entirely on that, and that's how it works. Wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit about your church, a little bit more about the architecture, and what exactly makes it stand out from some of the other churches in Moorhead? Well, it, it looks different because it is dark brown, and it has this very tall steeple, which you can see from a distance. I'm not sure how long that'll be because there's a new building that's being built just to the north of us. <laughs> but uh, it, it just looks English. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, as far as the Sudanese parishioners, um, do they um, incorporate their, some of their own cultures in different um, church activities, like different dinners or things like that? And tell me how. They do. Uh, they, when we have uh, food, mm -hmm. they contribute that. In fact, one of the highlights of our recent uh, uh, fundraiser Mm -hmm. was that we had refreshments afterwards and they pr produced some Sudanese delicacies that uh, everybody just loved. And, but, and they do this uh, quite often uh, and that's very nice. And then we like their music and that's fun. 
Do they have other relatives or friends and family from the Sudan that are, are still continuing to come over to stay with them and live here? Yes, and when they can, they go back to visit. Uh, there's quite a lot of going and coming uh, when they can manage it. They also have uh, an interesting custom, which is rather sad, and that is they have memorial services for relatives who have died in Sudan. Oh. Sudan. Um, and that happens tragically quite often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't go to those because it's not my business, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I told they're very well attended mm -hmm. by Sudanese. Now, Barbara, if folks would like some more information about uh, St. John the Divine Church, where can they go or what can they do? That's a good question, too, because right as of now, uh, our telephone doesn't work. Oh. But they could come to church. At the fundraiser, there were uh, maybe 60, 70 people, and several of them have showed up for services. Uh, the, for non-Sudanese, the service to go to is at 10.30, okay. and that happens every week. Okay, great. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for joining me today. I know you've been a parishioner of St. John the Divine Episcopal Church in Moorhead for years, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking me. Stay tuned for more. Now, we have a video produced by the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County about the history of the St. John the Divine Church in Moorhead, Minnesota. The Episcopal Congregation of St. John the Divine dates back to Moorhead's founding as a Wild West Railroad town in 1872. It began with 21-year-old pharmacist Benjamin Mako reading sermons in boxcars and tents. As the town grew, so did the congregation. In 1898, Moorhead's Episcopalians decided they needed a new, bigger building. Benjamin Mako and W.H. Davey asked an architect acquaintance of theirs to design a church for them, and for the low fee of $175, they got the plans for a beautiful Elizabethan Gothic church. Their friend was Cass Gilbert of St. Paul, the most important architect in Minnesota history, and by the time he died in 1934, he was hailed as the greatest American architect of his generation. The Episcopal Church is what Americans call the Church of England. It's common where English colonists settled on the East Coast, but the Northern Plains were settled overwhelmingly by Scandinavians and Germans at the end of the 1800s. Perhaps more so than anywhere else in the U.S., our region is dominated by Lutherans and Catholics. Episcopalians are pretty rare. And as the years went on, the congregation of St. John the Divine grew older, grayer, and smaller struggling to keep his doors open. Then the Sudanese came. For the past few decades, Sudan has been plagued by civil war. Millions of Sudanese people have died from violence and famine, and millions more fled for their lives and became refugees. Fargo-Moorhead has been a refugee resettlement community since the end of World War II, offering a safe new home for people displaced by violence. About 600 Sudanese refugees were resettled in Fargo-Moorhead between the mid-1990s and early 2000s, and most of them came from the southern Christian region of the country. Because Sudan was once part of the British Empire, most Sudanese Christians are members of the Church of England, or, as we call them around here, they're Episcopalians. The Fargo-Moorhead Sudanese community felt welcomed by their fellow Episcopalians in Moorhead, and they chose St. John the Divine as their new spiritual home. The struggling church was suddenly injected with dozens of young families. The congregation of St. John the Divine still worships in Moorhead's Cass Gilbert masterpiece, with services in English, 
Dinka, and Arabic. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. But as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.